The coronation of King Charles III taking place today. Our news was there. Long live the king. Plus, who is the king and what is his role? Our Marlena Leonard got the tea from a former governor general who danced with the man and the current British High Commissioner. And the Bahamas International Film Festival is happening this weekend. Get your tickets and go see a flick. The details in our arts and entertainment straight ahead as our news weekend starts now. Welcome to our news, the weekend edition, and thanks for joining us. I'm Berthony McDermott. Millions of people across the United Kingdom and around the world were up early watching in awe as Charles became King Charles III, a role he's been preparing for all his life. Our news was there for the historic event. Here is a recap. Westminster Abbey, the scene of yet another historic moment as King Charles became the 40th reigning monarch to be crowned there since 1066. The celebration started with a procession from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Abbey. More than 2,200 people from over 200 countries, including the Bahamas, were already inside the church by the time the king and queen arrived. Once inside, King Charles followed the age-old tradition and was presented to the people standing beside the 700-year-old coronation chair. I I here present unto you King Charles, your undoubted king. Wherefore, all you who are come this day to do your homage and service, are you willing to do the same? God save King Charles. It was then time for the oath. The Archbishop of Canterbury asked the king to confirm that he would uphold the law and the Church of England during his reign. Will you solemnly promise and swear to govern the peoples of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, your other realms and the territories to any of them belonging or pertaining, according to their respective laws and customs? I solemnly promise so to do. In his sermon, the Archbishop said, what was given today was for the gain of all. He stressed the importance of service. The King of Kings, Jesus Christ, was anointed not to be served, but to serve. He creates the unchangeable law of good authority, that with the privilege of power comes the duty to serve. The next step for the king was the anointing. His ceremonial robe was removed and he sat to be anointed, symbolic of the spiritual status of the sovereign who is the head of the Church of England. Then came the crowning moment. God save the king! Many have brought up the cost of King Charles III's coronation celebrations, possibly costing around 100 million pounds. The Center for Economics and Business Research estimates a boost of over 300 million pounds from the extra tourism and spending in pubs this weekend. We asked British High Commissioner to the Bahamas, Thomas Hartley, about the economic benefits of royalty recently. And while royal visits can have a steep price tag, he tells us... I think it, it's it's hugely popular. I think you know, the image of, of the UK around the world, of all the pomp and ceremony, is rooted in the royal family. I think that's a really important export for, for, for London. I think it's a really important export for the Bahamas as well. I know that um, when we've been talking a lot about uh, Bahamian exports to the UK, and there's been lots of in interest from, uh, from UK importers because of that royal link. He also highlights the American interest in the British royal family. And as Americans are just a flight away from us here in the Bahamas, we can benefit from the tourism opportunities that stem from U.S. visitors wanting to visit places significant to the monarchy. I'm certain that every time a member of the royal family visits the Bahamas, it, it generates a commercial and kind of tourism interest as well. You know, being so close to this U.S. market and knowing just how much Americans love the royal family, it puts the Bahamas on the real fr on the front line of uh, of uh, taking the opportunities for that the, the, the royal family generates. 
The solemn ceremony of King Charles's coronation taking place earlier today. But just who is the king and what is his role? Let's take a look back at this piece by our Marlena Leonard. Charles Philip Arthur George was born on November 14, 1948 to then Princess Elizabeth, Duchess of Edinburgh, just four years before she would become Queen Elizabeth II. After Prince Charles received his investiture as Prince of Wales in 1968, he became heavily involved in matters of the Commonwealth, including representing the Queen at the independent celebrations of Fiji in 1970, Papua New Guinea in 1975, Zimbabwe in 1980, and Brunei in 1984. Of course, he was also representing the Crown at our own independence independent celebrations in 1973. Future Governor General Dame Marguerite Pindling was center stage in much of the celebrations at the time as the spouse of the Prime Minister Sir Lyndon Pindling. She shares these memories with the young prince. He stepped off in his uniform, his, his official outfit, young and handsome he was. They also shared an iconic moment where the young spouse of the Prime Minister and the heir presumptive shared a dance. And all the formalities had uh, ended and he said to me, would you like to dance? And I said, yes. You'd like to dance? You could dance with this Calypso? And he said, yes. Well, my dear, when he took off on the floor, I didn't know where he went <laughs> to look for him. But um, we had a wonderful time. His Majesty was just 24 years old at the time of our independence celebrations in 1973. And while his mother acceded to the throne at 25 years old, this future monarch would have a much longer time to wait. British High Commissioner to the Bahamas Thomas Hartley says the decades of experience and service gives a window into what we can expect. Yeah, I think he's the, uh, the the prince that has waited longest to be king in the history of Britain. And uh, he's had more training and more investment and more time to, to show us the type of king he's going to be than anyone else. So I think we're going to see a lot of the same. And I think we're going to see a, a King Charles committed to the Commonwealth, a King Charles committed to climate change and sustainability, a King Charles that travels a lot, particularly to small island states around the world and a King Charles that will continue in the same spirit of Her Late Majesty in serving people first and uh, doing absolutely he can to champion the causes which he feels are globally important. And the King spent many of his years as Prince of Wales consistently focusing on one of the most pressing global issues of our time, the climate crisis, giving his first major speech on the environmental dangers of plastic pollution in 1970 at the age of 21. In 2021, he gave an impassioned speech at COP26 on the matter. But now, as King Charles III, will he still be able to campaign as strongly for the environment? Hartley tells us it may not be so simple anymore. The role of uh, prince and king are different. Uh, the king is a, is a constitutional role, and the responsibilities of that are different. But I think his personal passion and his personal commitment to these issues are, are bone deep. And therefore, I, I think we're going to see continuing kind of working behind the scenes, supporting those causes. And he's be, he'll continue to pioneer issues that, of those that are of global importance and importance to all citizens of the Commonwealth from 56 countries around the world. Even so, his dedication to the Commonwealth countries is clear, many of whom are small island states like ours, who are getting a near front row seat in this morning's historic event. As for the next time the Bahamas may see King Charles, Dame Marguerite tells us she hopes to get a moment to invite him soon. If I ever get the opportunity on this visit, I certainly will invite him personally and see if he remembers the little girl he danced with. And I said, we can do better now, you know, be older than wise. Thanks for that, Marlena. Just after the break, the Prime Minister visiting the National Archive while in London for the King's coronation. Stay close and good news for the unvaccinated. The U.S. has lifted restrictions and vaccinated passengers may now travel to the U.S. again. That's coming up when our news weekend returns. Today's Uniform Center, we've traveled to every island in this here land, man. We go everywhere. We can go to every rock and key, Abaco to Inagua, even Ragged Island, The Rock. Celebrate our country's 50th independence with today's special limited edition. Sublimated t-shirts and caps in 10 different styles and colors. Get up to 50% off on cotton polo shirts only. Don't forget to embroider your company's logo to celebrate this independence at Janae's Uniform Center, Chesapeake Road. Call 394-8385 or 6. WhatsApp, text only, 817-3295. Email sales at janae's.com. You're watching our news weekend. Welcome back. Days leading up to King Charles III's coronation, the nation's leader participated in a number of events in the United Kingdom. One of them, a visit to the National Archives in London. Jamila Mizek reports. 
Prime Minister Philip Davis paying a special visit to the National Archives in London this week. While touring the facility, Davis had an opportunity to view the archives special collection on the Bahamas. He says it was quite revealing to see some of the challenges the Bahamas faced as a country. We see some of the sympathies being expressed um, uh, by governors who were very anxious and concerned about the treatment of the majority of the people, um, the Negroes, as they call them in their dispatches, um, being um, deprived of education, um, basic necess necessities, lack of education, etc. I mean, it's rather revealing. Prime Minister Davis also sharing this takeaway from the timely visit. This also reminds me that that we truly need to um, look at how we um, keep and restore our records for future generation to be able to understand what is happening today um, so as to inform their future because understanding what's happening now will cause the next generation to avoid some of the pitfalls that we, are, that, that we may have fallen into. Now those on the tour were able to view documents from as early as the 1700s. Consultant to the orange economy in the office of the Prime Minister, Ian Poitier, shared some of what they were able to witness. We've seen maps um, of islands. Uh, we saw the Holy Ghost Islands off of Andros. We didn't know they existed. Um, what we're looking at now is a whole series of documents relating to independence, the pre-independence period. Um, it's, it's quite emotional, it's surprisingly emotional, you know, looking at the report into the Burma Road riots and what almost happened. The recommendations around corruption, um, uh, how to clean it up in the 40s and in, in the 60s. Um, you know, petition for the Bahamas to become self-governing. You know, and we're looking at the bit of paper that started that. Head of Modern Collections at the National Archives in the UK, Dr. Juliette Dupla, and Strategic Relations Coordinator Trish Humphrey say they're pleased to be able to remind Bahamians from whence they've came ahead of the Bahamas' 50th year of independence. We preserve the history of the nation, so it's it's a pretty important job, and it's important for us to give access to those documents as well. It's great, it's really heartwarming, and it's really nice to see that what we do is actually important to people, that preserving history means something to, to people today. It's always encouraging to us to see people enjoy what we show them and to have a personal connection with it, and that's probably the best part of my job. Reporting for our news weekend, I'm Jim a recent announcement from the Biden administration that eases COVID vaccination restrictions for unvaccinated travelers, creating quite a buzz as many residents are looking forward to returning to the U.S. Consular Chief at the U.S. Embassy here in Nassau, Jessica Elms Hoyser, says they're very excited to welcome unvaccinated Bahamian passengers back to the U.S. on May 12th something that we've received a lot of questions about already. Folks are very eager, but um, yeah, you can start traveling again uh, and no need for those COVID cards. So our phone's been ringing off the hook. We've been in communication with the Ministry of Tourism. Folks are excited to get traveling again and we are excited to have them. Of course, we would definitely recommend that folks take care of themselves and their health and get those COVID vaccines. Um, but however, you don't need to show that COVID vaccination card now. As for whether or not there are any concerns now that the vaccination mandate will be lifted, there was always the exemption process. There was ways for unvaccinated individuals who needed to travel to the U.S., uh, they could travel. And so we could help with that exemption process. So there's always been that option. Um, but of course, you know, as, as populations start to move again, we're going to see potential rises and illnesses or whatnot. But again, our main focus is that we're just excited to be able to help um, our Bahamian travelers get back to the U.S. and to experience all that it has to offer. Following a case of flooding at the Linden Pindling International Airport, Acting Prime Minister and Minister Responsible Chester Cooper assuring the situation was properly handled. Cooper says despite the incident, there was no disruption to services at the airport. I want to commend the uh, NAD as well as the Airport Authority and Ministry of Tourism and all of the stakeholders for uh, responding very quickly. Uh, there was no disruption to service. There was some discomfort, uh, certainly with some arriving passengers uh, between the time of the incident and up to about uh, 1 p.m.
The Nassau Airport Development Company said failure in a fire suppression line ended in flooding in the arrivals corridor near Bahamas immigration at the airport. The acting prime minister says the next steps include preventative measures. We anticipate that the work was done and cleaned up uh, by professionals in this area and we are going to continue to monitor it to ensure that there's no lingering issues like mold, etc. Uh, but the reality of it is that uh, uh, pre preventative maintenance will continue to be a key part uh, of what uh, the team does at Airport Authority and not. When our news weekend comes back from the break, the Royal Bahamas Police Force has lost a vital member of its team. Our Marlena Leonard has the story. Stay close for that. And employees of the Cable Bahamas group of companies are making fitness and healthy living a priority. The details straight ahead when our news weekend returns. Whether you're battling a chronic condition or offsetting a new injury, Doctors Hospital's comprehensive rehab services offer the help you need now. Go to Three advanced facilities at Collins Avenue, Carmichael Road in Cable Beach means your personalized plan for care is just a visit away. From physiotherapy to occupational therapy and speech and language pathology, our team approach is all about rebuilding together. For a full list of services, visit doctorshoss.com forward slash rehabilitation. Doctors Hospital, trusted in best care now. Isn't your health worth it? This is our News Weekend. Welcome back. News broke earlier this week that the Royal Bahamas Police Force had lost a vital member of their team in the form of an 11-year-old police dog, Rexo. We sat down with members of the K-9 unit to discuss the, his legendary legacy and the future of top-notch police dogs in the country. Marlena Leonard has the story. He was not just any dog. He's a dog that the members of this unit classify as a legend. He has been uh, nothing short of miraculous in some of the feats that he would have accomplished. Uh, wherever it was hidden, he would find it. Persons would hide things underground. They would hide things underwater. Wherever they hide it, Rexa would find it. Um, he was an intricate part of this family, and his loss will be felt immensely. Officer in charge of the K-9 unit, Assistant Superintendent Kyle Capron, tells us Rexo was a name known across the archipelago and was often specifically requested. But also in our family islands, where persons would call and request his assistance directly. They wouldn't call and say that they want a dog. They would say they want Rexo. A lot of other units that we support, whether it be the drug enforcement unit, mobile units, they would particularly call for K-9 Rexo because his reputation precedes him and his success. But I stand firm with a lot of colleagues here that really believe that they have the next Rexo in line. And he set a gold standard where plenty of people are trying to achieve that. So for the criminals and the wannabe criminals that think Rexo is gone, I assure you, if you hide it, we will find it. When asked what they need to help raise more Rexos. Training and exposure um, is important to travel and see what works best in different places because as you know the criminal element doesn't stay the same as you find ways to combat crime they find ways to get around what you have learned as it relates to combating the crime that they are trying to commit so we have to learn lessons from other places that experience the same things that we experience. Rexo himself was a donation from the United States government, Capron tells us. I can't say that the investment that, that they made in giving us Rexo has paid off in leaps and bounds. Um, I think there's no other single tool that the Royal Bahamas Police Force has had for a 10-year period that would have had the impact that Rexo had. In, in removing drugs and firearms from the streets. So um, training and exposure is very important. Um, as the criminals change, we need to change also. Reporting for our News Weekend Edition, I'm Marlena Leonard. Thanks for that story, Marlena. The Cable Bahamas group of companies encouraging fitness and healthy living among its employees with a 12-week fitness challenge called Choose to Lose. The challenge saw 23 teams, but only one winner. How does it feel being selected as a winner of this corporate challenge? Euphoric. 
Awesome, 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 awesome. Good, 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 good. So winning the challenge was amazing. Um, being new to the company, it was good to see that I'm employed at a place where they acknowledge healthy living, but not only acknowledge it, encourage it. The challenge started out with 23 teams from various departments within the company. Every week, there were activities that team members had to attend and complete. The winning team, four girls and a goal, says teamwork played a big part in their victory. We assist with holding each other accountable, with our exercising schedule, with our eating schedule, and we just were committed to our goal. CBL Vice President of Human Resources Ed Duncombe says the company thought it important to focus on the wellness of all its employees, and he says it won't stop here. We want to make sure that we continue, and uh, believe it or not, a lot of the employees are asking about um, other activities that will be taking place. So we want to make sure this becomes a staple initiative within the company, make sure we keep our employees safe, and making sure that they are working out and they're healthy at all times. So we will continue to do this. So watch the space for more things to come. The winning team says they plan on incorporating exercise into their daily lifestyle. I'll continue on what I ever was doing. That's attending the gym after work or before work. Um, on low days when I ain't feeling it, I guess I'll put my headphone on, do a little dancing, a little shaking, whatever it is to get it done. If you want to see the sunshine, you first must weather the storm. And that's easy because the weather report is coming up to prepare you for what's to come. And Bahamas International Film Festival takes place this weekend. Have you gotten your tickets yet? Stay tuned for the details in our arts and entertainment segment straight ahead after the break. Stay close. Welcome back to our news weekend. The boaters took to the high seas on that poker run today, but was the weather good for them? Let's have a look at the forecast over the next few days. The Bahamas International Film Festival is happening this weekend, attracting filmmakers from around the world to our capital to share their creativity and make new connections. We sat down with the creator of the Sunday at Il Poster Acanto, and Marlena Leonard has the story. Sats V. Rosenfeld and his crew are from New York. They're representing their film, Sunday at Il Posto Acanto, at BIF this weekend, surrounding a topic close to us all, life after lockdown. And it's really about uh, New York, you know, really suffered coming during the lockdown, during the pandemic. Uh, we were the epicenter and we probably lost more people than anybody. So when the lockdown was over and people were starting to come out, we wanted to make a film that celebrated the return to community, the, the return to life. Uh, so it's really a celebration of, of New York City, of the neighborhood restaurants, and of the people and community of New York, the multicultural uh, community that we all grew up in. With credits as a playwright, screenwriter, producer, and director, Rosenfeld is versed in the struggles of the industry, and we asked him to weigh in on some of the difficulties, especially in less developed markets like in the Bahamas. You know, a little bit, I know that in, from talking to Leslie a bit, and also what you shared with us, and you know, we know that it's a struggle. It's a, listen, it's a struggle everywhere to get movies made. It's never, it's never easy. But I think in a place in here, you have a little bit of, you're up against the marketplace, which doesn't necessarily exist yet here in the way that it does in the States. So it's sort of up to the people to kind of build it from the ground up. And that's a very difficult uh, assignment. But he says the reality is it's a challenge anywhere and it all comes down to passion. He says a lot of their process came down to favors and speed. They even tell us the restaurant they shot the film in was open and operating while they filmed. We shot an entire feature film in six days. 
and we used a family. So all of us grew up together. The people who are in the film are like family to us. We called in every favor that we possibly could. Everybody said yes. We all worked as hard as we possibly could and we got it made for a very inexpensive price mm -hmm. and it came out great. And so yeah. I think, it, it, you know, look, it is possible to, to, to do great work without Hollywood budgets. Reporting for Our News Weekend, I'm Marlena Lennon. Before we go, we want to thank Rally Francis, Jerome Sawyer, and our producer, Tanya Smith-Cartwright, for all of our royal props today. And thank you for joining us for our news weekend. On behalf of our producer and the entire technical team, I'm Berthony McDermott. Long live the king. Continue to enjoy your weekend, everyone.